So it's been it's been a, a, a transition that happened immediately. It was forced, but that's when I realized that you can make a tremendous amount of money in the residential pressure washing game uh, if you're targeting the right people. Welcome back to the Steel and Dirt Podcast. This is where we talk about equipment, construction, and making money out there in the trades. This is Mike Vidan, and Mike is the maestro when it comes to pressure washing. He's got a lot going on with it as far as expanding your business. There may even be some courses and things we'll talk about here later and how to make good money with a pressure washing business. Hey, Mike, welcome. Thank you for having me on. So let's talk about starting your own pressure washing business. How did you get into this? Well, my story is my story is probably a little bit different than most folks. Um, I uh, I never had any intention to to get into the pressure washing business, and I don't think most kids grow up thinking, you know, when I grow up, I want to be a pressure washer. I just don't think that's something that's on the top of the list of aspirations for young people. But um, I went to uh, college at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina. Graduated from there with a uh, a degree in um, political science of all things. And I was, my intent was to go to law school. I was accepted to USC law school. And then I had the opportunity to go into outside sales, um, which was going to help offset some of the costs uh, associated with law school. And with all of that being said, I went to go work for a commercial carpet manufacturer, um, did that for about a year or so. And then I moved, uh, moved from Dalton, Georgia, to uh, Atlanta, Georgia, where I went to go work for Georgia Pacific as, a, as an outside salesperson as well. Um, and then that eventually brought me down to Savannah, Georgia. And when I lived in Savannah, um, I went through all kinds of different little entrepreneurial ventures, if you will. I, I had one of the first online motorcycle parts and accessories um, websites. Um, I had actually a, a real motorcycle shop where we manufactured um, custom motorcycles, did some clothing lines, all of this while I was still working for uh, uh, one of the biggest, you know, Fortune 50 companies in, in the U.S. at the time. And um, I was working out at a gym and I had a couple friends that uh, I worked out with down there. And one of the guys was in the finance world and uh, he would come in every once in a while and he was wet. He was dirty. And, you know, we worked out early in the morning, 6.30 is when we get started. And I mentioned, I'd ask him one day, I'm like, why are you dirty and wet? And he goes, well, I own a pressure washing business and one of the guys didn't show up. So I had to go and take care of one of the commercial routes. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. Never talked about it again. And then about six, probably six to, I don't know, eight months later, he comes to the gym and he says, yeah, we're moving to uh, Virginia. I got a job offer up there and we're leaving. And just on a whim, I said to him, what are you going to do with the pressure washing business? And he said, probably just sell off the equipment and, uh, you know, get rid of it. And one of our other friends who is arguably probably one of the most intelligent and wealthiest guys that I know who owns a uh, huge um, gas station and convenience store uh, chain um, said, Mike's going to buy it. And I thought to myself, Mike's going to buy a pressure washing company. And he goes, yeah, he said, you've got the sales ability. You've got the marketing ability. Um, You know, this is right up your alley. And uh, I think it's a great idea. So I went home, told my wife, and she said, you don't know anything about running a pressure washing business. You don't know anything about pressure washing. Why do you think this is a good idea? And I said, well, Greg said it was a good idea. And she says, okay, then if Greg thinks it's a good idea, then we're going to move forward. So I, uh, you know, we negotiated a price. It was not a lot of money back then. Uh, It it was a lot of money. It wasn't, it in, in, in hindsight, in retrospect, it was not a lot of money for what I got. At that point, I think the business was grossing grossing about $65,000 a year. They had a, a couple guys that were both part-time. They were doing a lot of commercial work, um, concrete, d- dumpster pads, things of that nature for the restaurants around Savannah. And um, so I, uh, that's how I got started. I just, I, I bought an existing, very small business. And, um, you know, that's, that's, where the, that's where the journey started, if you will. So there had to be some obstacles up front. You didn't know anything a a, a lot about the pressure washing business. And like you said, you know, here's Greg saying you got the marketing background, sales background. Well, sure, that's going to work. 
But how hard was it to jump in and learn the actual mechanics of the business? Well, fortunately, I was mechanically inclined as far as the the, 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 the the components needed in order to actually perform the work. Now, I've never been on the ground myself doing the work, right? Like I, I've, I've had employees since day one, and that is probably the biggest obstacle that I've faced and continued to face for a very, very long time was employees, finding the right people, finding the, the trustworthy people that are going to be good stewards of your name, good stewards of your equipment. Equipment, right. If you're an owner operator, you know, your stuff's getting taken care of because if, if it's not taken care of, you're the guy that's paying for it. You're the guy that has to repair it. You're the guy that's losing downtime. If you're an employee and you don't care, then you're like, yeah, it breaks. Mike's going to have it fixed. Mike's going to, you know, whatever the case is. So finding the right people um, has been one of the biggest obstacles, you know, early on and, and actually probably the first 10 years. Um, and, and I also, you know, after after about 10 years, of the pressure washing business, we ventured into um, a completely separate entity, but based on, you know, the same kind of platform and infrastructure customer base, a, lawn, a landscape maintenance business. So we were doing lawn care. And um, so I ran that for about 10 years as well before shutting. I didn't shut it down. I sold it at the beginning of this year just because that was an issue. Uh, finding the right people, especially in today's world, was incredibly difficult. And it just wasn't worth my effort and my energy for, you know, what what I was getting out of it. But employees. You you talked a little bit about the, you know, the company was grossing about 65000 when you started it. W- when did the bell go off that this thing can really make money? Almost immediately. Um, and and really kind of what what transformed the business was was the Great Recession, right? In 2018, 2019, we were probably 90% commercial work, right? So like I said, we were doing a lot of restaurants, their sidewalks, their dumpster pads, their receiving areas. That was the bulk of my business. Very little residential work. Uh, that the recession comes and people start cutting back, right? People aren't going out to eat. The restaurants are not having you know, the same amount of success financially. And so they start looking at ways to cut back. And one of the first things that they did was cut out on just the maintenance, the exterior maintenance. So we got hit hard and I had to call an audible. And so basically I, I was watching my, my business just deteriorate. And so I, I made the leap to going into residential. Um, and you know, this is, this is you know, quite some time ago. And what I ended up doing was just opening up the old phone book and uh, just calling people randomly in the areas that I kind of recognized and saying, hey, we own, we have a pressure washing business. Do you need anything clean? Because at that point, my marketing wasn't, I, I had no marketing. I had no customer lists for residential because we were so focused on the commercial. So now, you know, we moved away from the commercial uh, to probably 20% commercial uh, 70% pure residential and the rest is multifamily. So it's been, it's been a, a, a transition that happened immediately. It was forced, but that's when I realized that you can make a tremendous amount of money in the residential pressure washing game uh, if you're targeting the right people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so the big challenge, and, and I'm here I am, I'm guessing, I'm throwing out lines here is when you first get into this is how to price this stuff because it's it's heavy labor i mean it's it's mainly labor and equipment and, and time so how did you go into that or what advice would you give these new guys coming in to how to, how do you sit down and accurately price a job so or can you Yes, you absolutely can. And, you know, I've got a YouTube channel and uh, one of the biggest questions that I get, like I see it all the time is, how do I price this? How do I price this? I get emails, text messages, DMs from these people that are saying, hey, can you help me price this? And, And honestly, it's the question that I hate the most, because there is no way that I can sit here in my office and tell you how you should price your job for your business, right? Our overhead is different. Our cost of goods is different. Our markets are different. Everything is completely different. So my advice to anybody is you have to have a very firm understanding of your numbers, because if you don't know your numbers, if you don't collect that data, if you're not, if you're not keeping up with every aspect of your business, then you're flying blind and there's no way that you can ever assess a price to any given service because you don't know, right? What's your bleach cost? 
What's your, you know, what's your target hourly rate? What is, you know, the cost of your, you know, every aspect of your overhead, your vehicles, your rent, um, your insurance, your workers comp, like everything comes into play. So you have to understand what that is. And you and I were talking before we got on um, about something new that we're doing. And it's, it's an app that we've developed. It's a, it's a CRM, a customer relationship management app, and it's called Quote IQ. And one of the features in Quote IQ is an, is a, an hourly rate calculator. And what this allows you to do is you open this thing up and you input all of your information, every expense for the month. And then it obviously calculates it out for the year. So you're looking at a, at a big picture of what your expenses look like. You're, you're putting in, if you have employees, what they're making per hour and, and that, you know, everything obviously is, is calculated out. Uh, so then you, you see what your, your target hourly rate should be, your break, well, I'm sorry, your break even point, what's your what's your break even point. And then from there, it allows you to put in whatever your percentage is based on how you know much you want to charge. Then you've got your target hourly rate for your business, right? Then you can go and determine how you're going to price a job, right? A lot of guys in our industry, and I'm sure in other industries, they price by, you know, kind of like national averages and square foot pricing and linear foot pricing. Um, and that's well and good. In, 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 this, in this app, it allows us to do both an hourly rate and a target, you know, square foot, which you're determining is best for your business, kind of a blend. And you can determine how you want to go about quoting. Um, but to answer your question, I think the more experience that you have, uh, the better base of knowledge you have on how long things are going to take, how dirty something is, is going to determine how long it's going to take, how intricate a roof is will take, you know, determine how long that roof is going to take to clean the amount of chemical, all of these things. Uh, come into play when you're pricing. And so experience is a great thing. Having the knowledge of your business and your numbers is another thing. Um, I kind of use a hybrid model at this point where I can just kind of look at stuff and I don't do any quoting in person, like for residential. If a customer calls me, I'll, I'll get their address. I'll plug it into Quote IQ. It pops everything up. I can, you know, I can get an estimate out very quickly. Um, but I, I never go to a customer's house to quote, it's just a waste of my time. It's a waste of energy. I, uh, you know, I can I can spend that time doing more valuable things for my business, and you know that comes to efficiency, right? The more efficient you are in every aspect, the more profitable you can be. Um, but uh, so you know, these customers will call. I'll give them a quote online, or I'll text them. You know, all these, all these, like I have zero interaction with um, with customers because I, I've I've been doing it long enough. I know based on square footage. I know based on the look of the house uh, what it's going to cost, and and it really cuts down on that interaction. Now I've I've got a guess that quote IQ could also work for other type of businesses. Absolutely, is this it? is for anybody that's providing home services, right? Um, it it we've got presets in there for a bunch of different service industries, um, but the, like the, the cost calculator, that's universal. Um, the your your this this app allows you to generate quotes, to send invoices, to collect payments, and that's in the free version. So that's pretty cool. You're able to do all of those things just downloading the app. Um, and then you've got like other functions. We've got a 28 point inspection that's fully editable for whatever industry you're in. So like when my guys roll up to a house, the first thing that they do before introducing themselves to the customer is they pull out the, the app and they fill in all the information, the customer's uh, name, and they walk around the house with this 28 point inspection and look for very specific things to our industry, open windows, uh, seals that are bad, are there plants that need to be moved in? And it allows them the opportunity to take pictures. Then it generates a PDF, which is sent to the customer. So they're aware of anything that could be a potential issue. Um, and it also allows us the opportunity to upsell as well. Like, hey, we also noticed your driveway was dirty. Send them a picture. Um, would you like us to take care of it while we're here? So all kinds of great things in the app. But yes, it's applicable to any service-based uh, business. It's, it's pretty awesome. Hey, we hope you're enjoying our show. And if you are, we would appreciate it if you would help us out. Crush that like button, hit the subscribe, and be sure notifications are on so you'll be notified whenever we release a new podcast, guide, or compilation. We appreciate the support. And now let's get back to the show. Now, um, as you got into this, 
where they're outside of, of labor, which is a challenge for everybody anymore. I mean, labor is just a flat out challenge. Outside of that, if you hit any crazy obstacles you didn't see coming after the first year or two, you get into year three, four or five and you're like, holy crap, I didn't, you know, I never thought this was going to be an issue. You know, honestly, you know, like I said, the recession was kind of like the biggest thing aside from the employees that really changed the course and uh, of, of the business and how I was running things and how I was approaching how we were going to go to market. Um, but I think more than anything is the, the biggest thing that I struggled with was understanding the value that we were provided. Right. And I say that because, you know, w- when you're starting a business, you might think, oh, I don't want to be too forward. I don't want to charge too much. I don't want to, you know, set people off. I don't want to take advantage of people, right? Well, at the end of the day, the people are calling you because they either don't want to do it, they can't do it, or, you know, they're they're just willing, they, they, they're willing to pay somebody else to do it. I think undervaluing myself and my business and, and, and what we offered was the, one of the biggest obstacles. And once I figured out that I needed to charge accordingly, that's when things really started to change. That's when I was able to make significantly more money. That's when I was able to start scaling at a rate that I'd never seen before. And so that's it. Valuing yourself, valuing your business and charging what you need to charge. You never should be ashamed of getting paid. The doctor's not ashamed, right? The the, the dealers, the car dealership's not ashamed and neither should we be. So that's, that's some, it's a mindset thing. Um, you, you mentioned the word scaling. Uh, what are some of the tactics or, or things that you use to scale your business? Well, I think one of the most important things, again, is charging what you can charge so you can maximize profitability. And with that maximization of profitability, you're able to then reinvest in your business. If you're making just enough to pay your bills, you're never going to scale. You're always going to be the dude on the truck pressure washing, right? And I, I would think that a lot of folks at some point want to be you know, in the office and running the business as opposed to be out there, you know, actually doing the manual labor. Now, a lot of guys say, oh, no, I want to do this forever. Well, your body's not going to be able to take it forever. You know, do you have a retirement plan? Do you have like, are, are, do, are you saving for the future? Um, but so to, to answer that question is um, the scalability comes from the reinvestment in your business, right? Putting money back in, right? And, and this is something that I struggled with at, at the beginning too. Like your dad, you know, he could fix a lot of things himself. And, and I used to do all of that myself. And then I realized like, do I value my time more or my money more? And I value my time more because my time is very valuable and I can use that time to make more money. So I'd rather just pay somebody to go do what they do the best and I'm going to do what I do the best. And so that's part of the scalability of a business is you have to, you have to set yourself up to scale. And if you don't set yourself up for, to scale, you're never going to. And growth, for me, that's the main focus, right? That's, that's, what, that's what keeps me up at night. And that's what motivates me to push forward every single day. Like I'm at a point, you know, with my business where, you know, it's on cruise control for the most, you know, for, for the most part. I, I've set things in, in motion and put things in place to where it allows me to focus on bigger picture things, not $9 or $10 an hour tasks. I'm focusing on big boy tasks like, you know, business acquisitions, building apps, you know, growing other things that I'm involved with. And, and that's, that's all part of the scalability um, is, is just investing in yourself, investing in your time. And again, that goes back to um, investing in your, yourself and your business, your education, right? Because in my opinion, and it's something that I struggled with because, you know, like, you're, you know, like a lot of guys out there, um, I can do it myself. Right. I can I can I can change the oil. I can I can make you know, I can build proportioners and I can do all of these things. Um, but I, I don't want to be doing that. And so I think it's uh, it's it's one of those things where as soon as you can kind of figure out where your strengths are, you're, you're able to uh, to move forward. So the YouTube channel, they can go on and, and, and here I'm guessing they can see some general information. They want to learn more. They can get to the courses. So kind of walk us through how all that works from the channel to the courses where they get those. Right. So the YouTube channel, um, that the, the, the entire intent in that is to give people um, a glimpse into, you know, the business side of 
a pressure washing business and really any service business, right? Business is business. It doesn't matter if you're selling, you know, landscape maintenance, if you're selling landscaping, if you're selling plumbing, carpet cleaning, whatever the case is, it's sales, right? Sales and marketing. Um, so that's really the foundation of the business. This, this, or this, the channel, this, this channel is not about satisfying content, right? It's not about, you know, stuff getting cleaned because you can go anywhere and get that. There's a lot of that on the channel because, you know, People like to look at that, but the real value comes from uh, my experiences and uh, my knowledge that I'm willing to share on the channel. And and it's it's a it's it's changed people's lives. And I'm not patting myself on the back, but I get these messages all the time that you know the information that I'm giving gives people the confidence that they can go out there and do this right. And I say it all the time: this is not rocket science. Anybody can pressure wash. If you know, you know, if you invest in yourself, the time you educate yourself, you learn how to do it. Anybody can do it. Um, It's the business side of things that I think is where most people fail. And so I'm trying to instill that the just like your question about how you price, you know, it doesn't doesn't matter what your competition is doing. I don't care what my competition is doing because my competition isn't paying my bills. Right. I am. And their business is different than mine. So I don't care how they're pricing, what they're pricing. I'm going after my target customer, my target audience. I'm going to, I'm going to market to them with precision. I'm going to close those deals and we're going to make a ton of money. Um, so it doesn't matter to me what anybody else is. And it all comes back to your marketing. Now I'm, I'm able to do that. I'm able to walk away from business on the daily because I don't need every job, right? If you've only got a few leads coming in, you need every job and then you have to be competitive. Your customer's determining your pricing, not you. But if you work on that lead flow, I say it on my channel all the time, lead flow equals cash flow. And if those leads are coming in, you're in the driver's seat, you determine how much you're going to charge, who you're going to work for, and and that puts you in a great position. Has there been a nightmare job that you've had to do that you just felt like I'm never going to satisfy the client or we're never going to get out of here? Gosh, I, I really can't think of anything. Um, you know, you and I were supposed to record a little bit earlier today. And um, I got a, a call about 10 minutes before you and I were going to hop on from one of my technicians. And he said, I'm hurt. And, you know, your heart immediately just stops. And I'm like, what happened? And he fell off a ladder. He was all the way at the top. The ladder slipped. It came out from underneath him. He he, he came down hard and, and he got he got hurt. He was rattled. Um, fortunately, the customer is an ER doctor and she came out immediately and was able to, you know, kind of survey the situation and, and, and treat him. And so it was a, uh, it was, it was, it was a scary thing, but those are the things, those are the nightmares are, you know, when, when things out of your control happen and, you know, what are you going to do, how you're going to react and, um, it, you know, I've had several of those over the course of, of my businesses, whether it's, you know, uh, we just got a brand new trailer about eight months ago from uh, Southeast Softwash. And they, they're the, they're, they build the premium equipment in our industry. And um, I was, I'm on vacation in Hilton Head. And another one of the techs calls me and says, I just got rear-ended uh, by a Mack truck. And it just completely messed up the back of this, you know, $26,000 trailer. And, you know, so what do you do? Well, it's out of your control. Um, you just make the best of it, right? And you 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 kind of bob and weave and, and call an audible and just you know do your best to adjust. And and when you do run into situations where it's um you know things are out of your control or things are going bad, then you just do your best to to overcome and, and make it through. Right, right, and, and you're right. That's all you can do. Now, after after you got started, was there a key client or something that came along in that first? few months that, that, uh, made you go, wow, this is, you know, this is the right thing. We, we got lucky. We had some, um, of the larger home builders, uh, that I was able to, you know, build some relationships with, um, early on. And this is back when the housing market was on fire and we were able to, uh, to pick up a lot of new construction cleaning. So we were able to fill up our schedule consistently um, and then backfill with, you know, our leads that were coming in. So that's big. And we've also had uh, a lot of success uh, targeting uh, the apartment communities around um, because those are those are great jobs to get. And they've got the money in the budget. And it's just about, you know, building those relationships, building that rapport, gaining their trust. And then you become the go to guy. Uh, a lot of times we'll ask about the biggest job. 
But, you know, really it may be more like what you just talked about, gathering up those guys on new construction. I don't know if you've got one huge client that you say, this is the biggest client, the biggest job we've ever had. Do you have one of those? Well, yeah. In fact, I, I made a I made a video with um, one of my friends who's actually my partner in the Quote IQ app, and that's Justin. And he's got a channel called Forever Self-Employed. And um, he had me on the channel and we were talking about the, uh, the biggest job. And, and this was six months ago. And um, it, there was a, uh, a job that we got actually off of a bandit sign of all things. This guy saw um, a bandit sign in his neighborhood and, uh, and gave us a call. And it turned out that he was the purchasing agent for uh, Fort Stewart, which is a military base uh, down in Hinesville, Georgia. And uh, he had called and said, hey, do you guys do you know, multifamily stuff? And I said, absolutely. And he said, I'd love for you to come down and give us a quote. And uh, it ended up being pretty much every single um, housing unit on Fort Stewart, which is one of the biggest bases in the United States. And that was, uh, I think that one was 140 K. And had you asked me this question, um, two weeks ago, I would have said that was the biggest job ever. Um, but I was fortunate to land, um, a relatively large job. I got a call and the, the message that I received was, uh, they had two 1 million square foot uh, buildings that they needed cleaned. And I thought, well, for sure, this is a typo. My service, you know, transposed something and it's a thousand or 10,000 square foot uh, building. Uh, but they were 1 million square feet buildings and they want them done biannually and they want the um, the roofs cleaned as well. And so uh, we are basically doubling that other price that I told you about. So, and that's over the course of a year. Um, but still, that's that's a, that's one of those dream, dream accounts to, to grab. So very excited about that one. A lot of great information today. This is proof, folks. You're always looking for proof when you're watching these podcasts and listening. Can I really make a good living in trades? You absolutely can. If you'll get out there and hustle, you'll market, do what you're supposed to do, learn it, treat people right, interact with your customers. Uh, it, it can be done. And, and Mike is a great example <laughs> of that. Mike, thanks for joining us so much. We really appreciate you and wish you all the best with your channel, with your, your app and everything you've got going. Awesome, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. 